tell you, go for it. Um, don't ask permission, just go for it. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you. And <laughs> all right, so let's all get ice cream. It's on here. It's on the video. No, that's okay. Uh, so glad to be here. Uh, I've wanted to come here for a number of years, actually. I've known about this place, and for some reason I just haven't made it. But, um, this is like going to India. It's a long way away. <laughs>
calls you Gideon? He says, rise up, O mighty man of valor. Mm -hmm. There are idols to tear down yeah, and people yeah. to motivate and lead. And don't say, who me anymore. Mm. Have you ever said, who me? Okay. <laughs> I don't want to put that on you if it's not there. But I believe the Lord says, rise up, o mighty man of valor. Mm -hmm. Amen. And you, Clay, the woman in white, you're, you're the woman in white on my sheet here. Mm -hmm. you? Yeah. Him. Yeah. I believe the Lord says that there's some healing in your heart that he's doing right now, and he wants to complete that before he launches you. Thank you, And you're ready to be launched, but he needs Thank to finish you, that healing. And when that healing is finished, you, the launch is going to be complete. So don't worry about not being launched. Mm -hmm. There's something going on. It's really important. Thank you, Lord. And Murray. Good friend, I know you, so this is a more of an encouraging word, but um, I felt like, I just want to say to you, there's healing in your hands. Amen. Don't, don't deny it, don't reject it, and don't doubt it. Okay, amen. And Beth, the Lord says, uh, you're right where you belong right now, be at peace, you're in God's will. Amen. amen. So don't worry about, well, I don't know what that means, I'm, trying, I'm not going to turn it. Amen. So thank you for giving me the liberty to do that. I don't do that very often, so that was that was fun. Thank you. thank you. And there's a real there's a real there's a real place of uh, freedom here, you know. There's a real thank liberality, you, Lord. place of liberty. You know, I have a special connection with Donna. I don't know if she shared with you. Did you share with them about the tree and everything? I'll just share with you guys. Uh, we're, we're part of a North Shore Pastors connection. They meet, meet once a month. And uh, we, we went on a retreat. It was a weekend retreat with all the pastors. And uh, we were in this sort of outdoor kind of three-season room, lots of windows looking out at the trees. And uh, it was a holy moment. And uh, we were praying for an extended period of time. And uh, just, you could just feel, there was just a holiness. You know how sometimes when you're in a gathering and it's kind of quiet and praying, you just feel this, the awe of God come into the room. So she started to sing the song, and I can never remember the name of it. We are yours. We are, your, we are yours. And she felt like there was a connection to the land. It's a, it's a Native American, you know, First Nation song. And when she started to sing that, she led the group, and we all started to sing it. I just had this sense I couldn't sit down anymore. I had to stand. There was something about rising in the presence of the, of the holiness that was in the room. So I stood, and uh, as I looked out the window, I've never had anything quite this powerful vision happen before. I looked out the window, and there were these big pine trees. I mean, big pine trees, you know, that just went straight up outside the window, about you know, 20 feet from the window. And I looked out at the pine trees, and the pine trees had faces on them. I mean, like real faces, and they were green with everything we were doing, as if to say, yes, this is good, you know, and, you know, it was just a, it was just a very unusual thing, I never really had anything quite that profound happen in terms of being able to see clearly, you know, and so uh, I came back there and I said, you know, hey, what, what's going on here, and uh, so I, I really believe that God has a, has a real calling to healing the land, you know, there's a calling, and it's probably on this group, too, to, to bring healing to the land. And, and one of the things the Lord showed me about this area, I'm not originally from New England. And, of course, you know, there's all this history on the ground. And there's all these righteous men and women that have lived here over the years, and you've had the awakenings. And there's been prayers that have been prayed into the ground, and there's been promises that have been given. And they've never been fulfilled. They were cut short for some reason. The enemy made somebody got sick and died, or who knows what, got attacked, got killed, you know, whatever. Stuff was cut short. It wasn't fulfilled. It wasn't in God's timing. It wasn't God's will, but it happened. You know, we're in a war. And so I believe that there are things that are waiting for us to unearth, bring to life, heal, whatever the right word is. And I think, I think Donna has... Uh, a real call in that area, connecting, you know, because uh, it says somewhere in the scripture about the trees and the rocks, you know, go to the rocks, if you want to find out what's going on, ask the rocks, I don't think that's a metaphor, I think the rocks, you know, they are a testimony, they have a testimony, the rocks
rocks and the trees have a testimony of what they've seen throughout their, throughout their lives. And I think as we become more sensitive to that, um, we, can, we can rest. Well, I, like I said, I was getting downloads of, of, of really, I, I had some things I wanted to speak on tonight, and I, I'm going to try to uh, continue through those because I believe the Lord has given them to me. But uh, I was getting downloads, and so I'm going to try to, uh, I'm going to try to adapt um, to what he's been saying. Um, you know, a lot of the songs that we were singing tonight were all about intimacy with the Lord. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, that's just something that we're coming into as a, as a church in general. You know, he's bringing us, he's bringing the bride into intimacy. And it's been happening for 20 years, you know. But it's even, it's getting accelerated. You know, as the world, as you turn on the news and you see that the, the Europe is about ready. You know that Europe is about ready to fall apart. You know, yes, yes. and you know that we are borrowed in this country. We are so borrowed that we are ready to collapse. You, you guys realize that? Right? Yes. And you realize? I just found. I just was reading the other day. You realize that that they've done something just recently in the United States. The United States that they said they were never going to do, and they are actually monetarizing our debt. Did you know that? You know what that means? Well, normally when you when you spend more than you take in, you have to borrow the difference, right? And, right. Mm -hmm. So if you spend a trillion dollars and you only bring in half a trillion, you gotta you gotta borrow half a trillion, right? And normally you would borrow from somebody like a, like a foreign government, or you put out bonds, and the and the American people would buy it, and they would bring legitimate money into the government, right? That's the normal way you do it, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a tricky way to do it. If, you, if, you, if you're in so much debt that nobody wants to buy your stuff, which is where we are, there's a tricky way to do it. It's called monetizing debt. What they do is the central bank has the authority to print money. So what they do is they just simply sell the debt to the national bank, say half a trillion dollars. The national bank, instead of having the money, which it doesn't have, it just prints a half a trillion dollars and it sells it out to the banks and to the community. And voila, it's all saved. But what happens is you just increase the amount of money supply by half a trillion dollars. And so even though there's a false sense of security, it looks like we fixed everything, the interest rates stay low, the thing is about ready to explode. You know, it's about ready to explode with inflation. I mean, bread could, you know, in, in, a, in a year, bread could cost $35 a loaf. You guys are aware of this, right? That we're sitting on a bubble, you know, we're sitting on a time bomb bubble. In Europe, you know, half the countries are already bankrupt. Am I, am I is it okay if I talk about this? Yeah, absolutely. And so I think we're in a, we're in a, we're in a, a unique and wonderful time, you know. We're in a perilous time. We're in a scary time if you don't have security in God. Uh, we're in a fun time. We're in a time that, you know, the prophets have seen throughout history. And we're in a time that miracles can occur. Because you know when miracles occur is when you're in desperate situations, right? When there's no food on the table. And you pray, oh God, oh God, where's the food? And you open your eyes and there's food on the table, right? Unfortunately, that's where the miracles occur. It kind of waits till the last minute. I keep asking it for $100 million, but none of my lottery tickets ever have any numbers at all. So that's a clue I should probably stop buying. Huh? So, what the Lord impressed upon me to share tonight was really about intimacy and about how do we really know our God. In other words, in times of trouble, in times of difficulty, when the enemy sets us up, when it's the darkest hour, how do we, how do we survive? What's the, what's the fundamental foundation? What's the thing underneath us that keeps us, that keeps us going? I picked up the little, I picked up a little card uh, from the, uh, from the side there. You know, it's. Who I am in Christ. You guys have seen, you've been around for any number of years, you've seen these. These have been around forever. I remember when I was 20 years old, they, they were around. So why do you think these are around all the time? I, you know, who am I? I'm God's child. I'm united with the Lord. I've been adopted as God's child. Do I need to speak into this for any reason? No. 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 Okay. All right. 
um, I've been bought with a price, I'm secure. You know, you, we constantly see these things. So there must be a need for this, right? I'm going to talk about that, a need for that. Um, one of the reasons there's a need for that is that the enemy sets us up. Did you know that? I used to think, I used to think that Satan or the enemy was just this sort of universal bad fog. And you just sort of, it was just sort of everywhere. But then I, I ran into a guy named Howard Pittman. Have you ever heard of Howard Pittman? Mm -hmm. Howard Pittman is a little, a little preacher from Louisiana. I don't know if he's still alive or not, but he was a preacher and he preached the gospel out on the streets, handed out tracts and had an aneurysm, died, went up to heaven, got, you know, uh, showed him around. And on his way up, he was taken to the second heavens. And he was shown the enemy, he was shown the hierarchy of the demonic realm, and he was shown how they, how they work and how they counsel together, and, and he was given a lot of information. And one of the things that really has never, has never left me, has always stuck with me, about his testimony was he said that the enemy, they know you. They know you specifically by name, and they actually plan and arrange circumstances to actually get you. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Not just, oh, well, you just happened to run into a bad situation today. No, that, that situation was set up because, you know, the enemy knew he sent his demons there to specifically get you. And I'll give you an example of that. I was, when I was a young man, I was, I was about 29 years old. I had just started working for Texas Instruments. I, I lived in Tex, uh, Dallas, Texas for a number of years. And, uh, and I, was, I was fighting lust, you know, and I was... No, I'm not going to lust. I'm not going to look at women. I'm not going to, you know, I just, it was a constant battle. And so I would pray, and I would fight, and I would pray, and I would say, I'm going to have victory today, you know. And I remember this one day, I was really feeling strong. And I said, I've got it. I'm going to have victory. I've got this thing, you know. And uh, I, I was working at, at my desk, and there was a big hallway. It was a huge, junk, gigantic hallway, and everybody would go out there, and that's where all the brake machines were, and there was thousands of employees in this building. And so I went out there this one day, and I was having the victory. I was strong. I had determined that I was going to make it. And I'm sitting there, and, you know, when you're in a building, a section, you, you kind of know all the people that work in that building. You see them every day, and you're aware of who is where, and you know that you may not know them by name, but you know them by sight, right? So I'm sitting there, and this woman walks out. I had never seen her before in my life. She was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen in my entire life. And she was dressed to the hilt, shortest skirt you could ever imagine. And she walked right in front of me. And I'm like, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> and I just, it's kind of, I mean, my tongue was hanging out. And at first I didn't realize what was going on, you know, because I was too caught up with <laughs> But... After I went back to my desk and the next day, I never saw this woman again in the building ever. And it dawned on me, that was a set up by the enemy, just for me, to slay me, to knock me down, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. To discourage me, mm -hmm. you know, because I was discouraged. I went home, like, man, I don't know if I can do this. I, this is not working. I can't do this. this, is, this I, can't, I can't do this. I was discouraged. And so, and so what we need is we need a real, we need a real revelation of who God is and, and how he's for us. Mm -hmm. And I want to share with you just a little bit about my life story, about how I came to that realization. And I'm still in the process of coming to that realization. So that when the circumstances of life come, whether it's a temptation, or whether it's a bad report from the doctor, or whether it's money problems, or whether it's relation, you know, whatever the thing is, just general stuff that happens in a fallen world. Can we be rock solid? Because when we look at Europe, when we look at the economy, when we look at the stuff that's ahead of us, we realize that we better get it together. We better really know our God. You know what I'm saying? And I think he's giving us time. He's giving us time to get prepared. He's telling us, you know, he's, he's showing us. He's saying, he's calling out. The word is going forth. You know, prepare, prepare, prepare. And so I, I just want to talk about that a little bit in terms of do we really know the grace of God? Do we really know that God loves us? I mean, it's easy when we're here. When we're here on a Saturday night, 
Man, it is easy to know the love of God, isn't it? You know, the songs are great, and oh, the feeling is good, and the presence is here, and people are so nice, and they love you, and you know, they don't know about what went on the other day with you. And so, it's easy. No, seriously. You know? I mean, if you guys knew the stuff that I went on, you know, two weeks ago with me, I mean, you wouldn't like me. Right? You really knew, you know what I'm saying? If you really knew each other, that's our fear. Our fear is, if anybody ever really found out what I was like, they wouldn't like me. Am I talking to myself here? No. <laughs> That's generally the fear. And I tell you, that that's, most Christians feel that way to some degree. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, the world feels that way all the time. The world feels that way all the time. I just want to read a couple scriptures. Just to remind us what it's like. What did God really promise us? The first one is Isaiah 54, verses 9 through 12. And this is from the New Living Translation. And God is saying, just as I swore in the time of Noah that I would never again let a flood cover the earth, so now I swear that I will never again be angry and punish you. For the mountains may disappear and the hills may, dis may move, but even, when my faithful love but even then my faithful love for you will remain. My covenant of blessing will never be broken, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. O storm-battled city, troubled and desolate, I will rebuild you with precious jewels and make your foundations of lapis. I will make your towers of sparkling rubies, your gates of shining gems, and your walls of precious stones. Now some people believe that this speaks of the thousand year reign of Christ in the millennium. But most everybody believes that it's a metaphor. You know, at no time in Israel did they have towers of sparkling rubies. Right? So this is a metaphor for the church. This is a metaphor for God's love for us. It's a metaphor. Precious, I will rebuild you with precious jewels. O oh, troubled and de desolate, O oh, storm-battled city, I will make your foundations from lapis. I will make your towers of sparkling rubies, your gates of shining gems, and your walls of precious stones. That's a metaphor. It's an image of what he wants to do. He's bestowing, he's promising perpetual favor on his people. I'm going to read to you from one of the commentaries. It says, the idea seems here to be that no calamities could spread over the whole church and sweep it away. As the water swept over the world in the time of Noah, or as desolation swept over Jerusalem and the whole land of Canaan in the time of the exile of Babylon. There would, indeed, there would be indeed persecutions and calamities, but the church would be safe amidst all these trials. The period would never arrive when God would forsake the church and when he would leave it to perish. Amen? And that's what he's saying. The victory, the victory that God won in Jesus Christ is so amazing that if we could ever really get our minds, our hearts, our spirits around them, we would be profoundly changed, and we would change everybody around us. Mike Bickle, I heard Mike Bickle do an interview recently, and uh, he said, God's grace, the grace that God gives through Jesus Christ is scandalous. Mm -hmm. It's scandalous. It's so amazing mm -hmm. that it's, it's a scandal. We can't, you just, you cannot believe it. You cannot take it in. Let me read to you from Isaiah 51, or 55, I'm sorry, verses 1 through 13. Is anybody thirsty? This is the invitation that God is giving to his people. Mm -hmm. Listen to the words, listen to the beauty, the love in these words. He says, is anyone thirsty? Come and drink. Even if you have no money, mm -hmm. come, take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's beautiful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Is anyone thirsty? Come, even if you have no money, take your choice of wine or milk, it's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me, and you will eat what's good. You will enjoy the finest food. 
Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. And I will give you all the unfailing love that I promised to David. You know, wasn't it just, didn't you just feel good when you heard those words? As I read those words, didn't they stir victory in your spirit? Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. An everlasting covenant. Never to end. Verse 4, see how I used him to display my power among the peoples? I made him a leader among the nations. You also will command nations you do not know. And peoples unknown to you will come running to obey. Because I, the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, have made you glorious. He's talking about the church here. I mean, yeah, there's some, maybe some applications for Israel at a certain time in history. But this is a prophetic word to us. This is about the church. It's about, the pe it's about anybody that calls themselves the people of God. Whoever they might be. Verse 6, seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he's near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God, for he will forgive generously. I love that word. Yes, turn to our God, for he will forgive generously. You ever been around somebody that forgives sort of sparsely? You know, I forgive you, but next time I see you, I'm going to cross over to the other side of the street. You know, you know what I'm saying? I forgive you, but I'm really not going to ever reveal myself again to you, you know? And, and that's normal, you know? But God, but God is not like that. That's why this is so outrageous. I mean, we can't even get our hearts around it. He will forgive generously. In other words, I, if I sin and I say, oh God, help me, and he just wipes it out. And then I do it again, and he wipes it out again. And it says, if you lack wisdom, just ask him, and he won't even upbraid you. In other words, he won't make fun of you for asking for wisdom. And you can go to him again and again and again. His grace is so outrageous. Verse 8, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. Mm -hmm. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. I like to say, you know, imagine the best father you can think of. Bill Cosby. <laughs> best father. Whatever you think of as the best. This is the guy is the best father. He's balanced. He's a disciplinary, but he loves. He's smart. You know, he's the best. And God is better than the best. Because why? Because his thoughts are nothing like our thoughts. His ways are nothing like our ways. You know what I mean? Just think about all the things that you have. People that got sick and you thought it was a terrible, where's God? And then all of a sudden they get well and they're changed and now they're on fire for the Lord and it was the best thing that ever happened to them. And you thought, man, this was bad. Or the people that go through divorces, you know, and again, and there's evil in the world and I'm not justifying every bad thing, but I'm just saying, God has a way of coming into the midst of difficult situations like divorce and death and sickness and turning it around for good. Because his ways are above our ways. They're far beyond. And he sees things that, uh, just, you know, they're far beyond anything. It says anything that we could even imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And then verse 10, one we've heard before, it says, The, the rain and the snow come down from heaven and stay on the ground to water the earth. And they cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It, it is in the same way with my word. I send it out, and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all that I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. And what, what I want to emphasize here is his promises to us, his covenants to us, in the area of what Jesus did for us, in the area of grace, so that when calamities happen, when difficulties happen, we can rest in that grace. But nothing will slay us. Verse 12. You will live in joy and peace. The mountains and hills will burst forth into song. And the trees of the fields will clap their hands. Where once there was thorns, cypress trees will grow. Where nettles grew, myrtles will sprout up. These events will bring great honor to the Lord's name. 
they will be an everlasting sign of his power and his love. Again, that never happened in Israel. So you either have to believe that's a metaphor for Israel, or probably more likely it's a metaphor for the people of God. And I believe that's a metaphor for the church, and I believe he's describing the church there. Once where there were thorns, cypress trees will grow. In other words, where there's thorny areas in your life, where there's problems, where there's difficulties, he's going to make a cypress tree grow. Where nettles grew, myrtles will sprout up. These events will bring great honor to the Lord's name, and they will be an everlasting sign of his power and love. Now we all know that this is what God wants to do for us, right? As I read these verses, everybody has, should have had a yes in their spirit. Everybody should have said, yes! That's what I want. I, that's me. I've got that, man. I want that promise, right? Every single one of us, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is in every one of you, and it's a down payment, and that Holy Spirit is saying, yes, 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 yes. Every time we read words like this from the, from the, from the, from the living God, that Holy Spirit is witnessing to your spirit, and he's saying, yes, that's for you. Yes, that's for you. Yes, that's for you. You can do that. You can heal the sick. All right. That's what he's saying to you. So why is it hard? Why is it so hard then to live in total freedom? Why is it so hard? Why do we need these cards around all the time? Why is it? And I'm just going to take you through a little bit of my journey, okay? Take you through a little bit of my journey, and just hopefully that will help you in some way. Maybe a nugget will fall out, and it will help you in some way in your journey. I'm going to tell you about my story, my salvation story. I was a young man. And uh, I'm 62, so I grew up in the era of Billy Graham being on TV. How many people grew up with Billy Graham being on TV? Black and white and then color, right? And my parents would watch Billy Graham. They were, they were sort of denominational, but they were devout Christians, you know. And they would watch Billy Graham. And I was kind of a rebellious teenager. And uh, I would watch Billy Graham with them, but I didn't want them to in any way get any indication that I was being affected by this, you know, you know, when you're 14 years old, you know, you don't want your parents to know that anything's going on anymore. But I was truly being touched. And Billy Graham would, would give the invitation, you know, and if you're in the, the bus away and you've heard the invitation, right, come on down to the front of me. And I'm so convicted, I'm sitting in the living room. Well, I would just get up real coolly and I'd go to my room, you know, and I'd close the door and I'd fall on my knees, oh God, oh God, oh God, save me, oh God. You know, I'd do the same thing, you know, get convicted, go to my room, pray on my knees next to the bed. And I guess God got tired of that, or he wanted to give me what I call a stake in the ground, you know what I'm saying? I don't know what it was, maybe he just, I don't know, I can't interpret it. So, a few years go by, and I'm in 10th grade English class, and I'm messing with a girl who's sitting in front of me. I'm kind of interested in her. And, you know, I was kind of trying to get a date with her. She didn't really want anything to do with me. And uh, even though I was good looking, you know. <laughs> but, uh, so I kept bugging her and I kept bugging her. And I guess she figured she'd get rid of me by inviting me to this Youth for Christ rally. And so I went with her. We went with a whole group of people. And I went there and I'm standing in this. I remember they had the metal, metal folding chairs, you know. And, I'm um, standing there holding on to the metal folding chairs, and this preacher is preaching, and there's this whole room of kids, and he's preaching directly to me. You ever had that happen? I mean, it was like he was talking to me, and I'm there, oh, man. And so at the end, so at the end he says, you know, just invite Jesus Christ to come into your heart. So I just remember I'm standing there, and I'm holding that metal chair in front of me, and I just say, Jesus Christ, please come into my heart, because I'm tearing up a little bit, and I don't want anybody to see it. It's dark, you know, so I'm okay. And uh, I'm, I'm there. Jesus Christ, please come into my heart. And I mean, this thing hit me so unexpected. I mean, boom. It, it's, it, it, I, the only way I can describe it is it's like it's the difference between imagining a train coming through that wall and actually a train coming through that wall. Because something hit me, and it, it, it felt like I had been carrying around a huge weight on my shoulders, and it was instantly removed. And I was floating. I felt pure completely all the way through the inside. I had total peace all the way through my inside. I didn't. I, I was so at peace, I didn't even need to tell anybody anything. Very unusual, you know. I actually thought I was...
is floating. And you know how you, you, you carry around a pack all day or something, and you take it off and you have this sort of light feeling? Well, if you amplify that by, I don't know, a thousand times, that's what I felt. And I was floating. I thought, sure, I was floating, but I was so at peace, I didn't even need to tell anybody. And I remember walking up to some people, or floating up to some people, I'm not sure what, and uh, they were talking to me, hey, we're surprised to see you here. And uh, they started to talk to one another, and I thought, oh, good, this is an opportunity. I can look down to see if I'm floating. You know? And I looked down, and I remember distinctly, I still have this image in my mind, my feet were on the ground, and I was surprised. I'm like, oh, I guess I'm okay, they're on the ground. Now, why did I do that? I I'm not sure exactly why, but I believe that there was a fundamental problem with me believing in God that He was good, or that he would be there, you know, because I just kept going back. You see, I kept going back trying to get saved. I kept going back. I was never going to be good enough. And I think the Lord just finally said, okay, look, I'm going to give you something, you know, so that you never doubt again. I mean, I don't care. The darkest thing can happen. I can be in the dark. The doctor can give me the worst news in the world, but you're never going to take that, you're never going to take that event away from me. You know, I know there's a Jesus Christ, and I know he's God. There's no question in my mind. You know, and the worst thing can happen, but I'm never going to, I'm never going to doubt that. You're never going to take that away in the darkest of the darkest moments. So, when difficult times occur, I've got this to go back on. But in general speaking, generally speaking, when difficult times occur, most of us, most Christians, now it may not apply to very many of you in this room, you guys have a real deep walk, but in general, the things I'm going to share now, they can apply, they apply to most Christians, they may at some point apply to you in some place, but I think they can also, you can also take these principles and apply them to the people you come in contact in the outside world, because I guarantee you the people in the outside world feel this way, and where it starts, where it starts is with your behavior. Okay? At some point, you just don't feel very good about yourself. And something erupts in your behavior that you just don't like. Stuff comes out. You get angry. You try to have victory, but you don't have victory. Trials wipe you out. Again, different people, different degrees. And at some point, you can have victory, but then at some point, maybe you fall into this. Okay? Christian life seems hard at times. Depression, you know, maybe happens occasionally. You just get discouraged. Bible reading just doesn't have any real life to it. You know, you're sort of going through the motions. You have to kind of force yourself to pray. Does God really listen to you? You know, does He really care? And that's the way it usually surfaces. Usually what happens is something happens in your life, an event relationship, discouragement, and, and it exposes this underlying problem that's in your life. And again, it may not happen very often, or it may be something that's chronic. Lots of Christians, this is the chronic underlying way in which they feel. They just don't let it out. Right? And I guarantee you that most of the world feels this way. And so, what's underneath that? Let's go down a couple layers and see what we can find that will change and give you victory. What's underneath that, what's underneath bad behavior and, and, and depression and things breaking out on the surface is really how you view yourself. You see, most Christians and everybody in the world views them, themselves through shame or failure. And again, it's because we have an enemy. We have an enemy out there that is constantly trying to tell you that you are a failure and that what you did is shameful and that there's no recourse for it, and that you can't keep going back to God, or whatever the thing is. That there's, just, there's no hope. And so most people feel themselves to be pretty much a failure. And again, like I said earlier, most Christians, may not apply as much in this room, but most Christians that don't have that real intimacy with God, most Christians are afraid that if anybody found out what they would really like, no one would really like them. You know what I'm saying? I've got to hide, I've got to really protect and hide. I can't really be vulnerable because if anybody really found out what I was like, you know, I, I, I'm such a failure. And they're ashamed, and most Christians are ashamed of how much they fail Christ. Now again, 
may not apply totally in this room, but I bet you it applies at a point in everybody's life. Okay, and if it does, if it shows up, if that shows up, if that underlying problem shows up, if those thoughts show up in your life, then we've got to go deeper. And again, I guarantee you, it shows up in almost every non-Christian's life. And so, when we go deeper, we find out that underneath that, underneath that, underneath bad behavior and not feeling good about myself, feeling that I'm a failure all the time, underneath that is really how I view God, or how God views me. How does God view me? Is he, is he waiting for me to mess up? Is he distant? Now, he would be happy if I would shape up, right? If we would shape up, if we would have a quiet time every day, if we wouldn't get mad at the person that we get mad at all the time, if we wouldn't do that thing we're supposed to do, you know, if we wouldn't do those things, then maybe he would be okay with us. But the problem is, we, we can't do that. We seem to fail. And so God can't be pleased with us. And so basically, underlying that is, <laughs> He doesn't really like me. Most Christians, if you get down to it, if you really get down to it, most Christians, or, or at least every Christian at some point when calamity comes, have this feeling that God really doesn't like them that much or really doesn't accept them that much. Am I, am I communicating? Does yeah. that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so what's underneath that? What's underneath that is your basic view of God. And a lot of this bad view of God and bad view of how God views you comes from our heritage in the Christian church. You know, our heritage in the Christian church is, is basically shape out or ship up or ship Shape up or ship out, right? <laughs> yeah, no, really, seriously, you know? It's been about works. It's been about legalism. It's been about can you perform, right? You know, and we need ushers on Sunday, you know? No, seriously, that's what it's been about. And if, you don't, um, if, you don't, if you don't perform, then you just don't measure up and God is not going to accept you. Mm -hmm. That's basically where the Christian church has been for the last hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And God forbid if, you, forbid if you're a Jew. You know, let's just kill them, really, you know. So this comes out of, and, and the enemy has set us up. The enemy was very happy to promote that type of legalism. Mm -hmm. Because it destroys and it discourages. So underneath all that is who God is. Is he mad, sad, or aloof? Most people believe he's mad, sad, or aloof. But that's not what the scriptures say about our God. A lot of the songs that we sang tonight were songs that talked about who God really is. But there's, see, there's a difference. It took me years and years and years. There's a difference between singing about it and knowing it in your head and knowing it in your heart when the calamity comes. You know, I, I sat under a, in, in Dallas, I was, uh, went to a Bible study for a year and a half. And thank God for these two pastors because they, their one message for a year and a half was, does God love you? Do you know that God loves you? Do you know the grace of God? And they would preach you in different ways and they'd have different examples. But week after week after week, I sat under that teaching. And you know, it took almost a year, every week of hearing that, before it really began to sink in, before I really began to believe it in my heart, and it would actually change my actions when difficulty came. Everybody understand what I'm saying? So there's a huge difference between just hearing it and even reading it in the Bible. You know, you can read it in the Bible and your spirit can leap. And you can say, yeah, that's true. But then, does it work its way down mm -hmm. into really faith? Mm -hmm. And so, basically, the Bible's view of God is that He's happy. And that He wants to lavish His love on you. And if you could meditate on that, if you could meditate on that to the point where you really get it. If you could, you know, what I've done is I've, I've just taken scriptures about who God is and how He feels about me and how He wants to love me and how He wants to lavish us. There's a, there's a scripture, I, I wish I'd written it down, I, I didn't write down which one it was, but there's a scripture, uh, I think it's in the New Testament, and it talks about God's purpose, God's purpose in saving you is so that throughout all future ages, 
He could demonstrate to all the principalities and powers and the angels that he could have someone to lavish love on. That that's why he created you and that's why he saved you. So he can have someone throughout all the ages to come to lavish love on. And can you imagine that? Lavish love. That that's what he wants to do. And that's who he is. And if we can get that down, if we can get that down into our hearts, then we have the victory. And you see, once you get that down, once you understand that God is happy, that he's glad, that he's not an angry God, that he's not sitting back aloof, but he's actually involved in who you are. He wants you to have the victory. Once you get that down, then you realize that he really loves you, that he loves you in the midst of your failures. You see, that's another thing that's so hard for us to realize. I'm not a parent. Well, most, most of you are parents, or at least you understand parenting. And I heard this example, Mike Bickle gave me this example a number of years ago, and I love it because to me it's perfect, it crystallizes the idea. It's kind of like you as a parent, and you see your child, and your child's in the other room, and they're learning to play the piano. And, you know, they're just starting. And so they're, you know, and they're making all kinds of mistakes, and the music isn't really that great, you know. But what's in your heart? Do you come in the room and say, shut up, man, that's terrible, you, know, you missed that note. No, you don't do that, not if you love your kid, and we all love our kids, right? What do you see? You see the yes that's in that child's heart. You see in that child a desire to do right. And so you are there to encourage everything you can to, to, to that child to be victorious, right? Right? Am I not true? Yeah. If you can do that, being an, an evil parent, then how can you be so deceived by the enemy to think that God is not going to do that for you? Mm -hmm. So in the midst of your failure, in the midst of you playing the wrong note, in the midst of your rebellion, in the midst of all the things that go wrong in your life, God is for you because He sees the yes of your spirit. Mm -hmm. And He loves you. Mm -hmm. And again, can we get this in our heart? Because if we can get this in our heart, if we can understand that God is happy, that He's not sad, He's not mad, He's not aloof, that He's for us, He's active, and that He loves us in spite of who we are, in spite of any kind of difficulties. If we can get that, then how does that, that will change radically my view of myself. Will it not? Mm -hmm. No longer will I see myself as a failure. No longer will I see myself through a filter of shame. Because why? Because I have an eternal God who loves me in spite of my difficulties. Mm. And if I can get that, if I can get that into my spirit, if I can really grasp that in my heart, then nothing can stop me. Because I know that I am victorious. Mm -hmm. I'm not shameful. You see, my sins are covered by a God who loves me, who knew that I was going to sin before the foundation of the earth. And He already made a, a, a covering for it. When I apply 1 John 1 9, my sins are gone. Mm -hmm. They're remembered no more. And so if I have this view of myself, then what does that do for my behavior? I have a good view of God. I know He's happy and glad. <coughs> I know that He loves me in spite of my difficulties, in spite of my sin, that He sees the yes of my spirit. I know that I'm victorious, that I can do no wrong because I have a God who's for me. And even when I do sin, I can immediately get it erased. And so then what happens to my behavior? My behavior then just comes out of that relationship with God. It just comes out of that happy knowledge. You see, all of a sudden, there's no condemnation in Christ. I have peace and joy. and I, It's like all of a sudden, my behavior begins to change. And I don't know how it happened. I didn't try to make a change, but just because of my different view of God, just because of my scriptural, real view of God, just because I have the faith to believe it now, and I have the faith to believe how He looks at me, and I have the faith to, to believe that I am victorious in Him, my behavior just naturally changes. I have peace. I'm not anxious about stuff that's going wrong. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I want to please my lover. I have joy in my heart. I'm not worried about things. Mm -hmm. And how does that affect me? It affects my ministry. Did you know that most people in ministry are not happy with their ministry? Mm -hmm. 
Most people in ministry, most ministers, I mean, so many ministers quit on a Monday. Do you know that? <laughs> no, Monday is the biggest day for ministers to quit. Because ministers and people that are, are trying to do the will of God are filled with burnout and frustration and failure because they can't seem to live the Christian life because they have a wrong view of God. But when you have a right view of God and your behavior is changing and you know that you're loved and you know that you're plugged into the source of life and that He's given you life and that He loves you, then you can give out even if somebody bites your hand, and let me tell you, when you begin to give out to people that are hurting, they will bite your hand. Have you noticed that? Yeah. They will bite your hand, and they will say, you know, why did you not give me more? And you're looking at your fingers. <laughs> I'm serious. And so you can do that, because why? Because you have an infinite source of love that's pouring into you, so you can pour out. And if they bite your finger off, you just say, God, heal it, you know? And you can love them. You don't have to experience burnout. You don't have to experience frustration in your ministry. Because you have peace and you have joy in your life. Amen. Amen. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to pray for you guys. The final result of all this is that even if the worlds collapse, even if Europe falls off the earth, even if the United States money collapses, even if you're thrown in prison, even if you're beaten with baseball bats, you know, it doesn't matter what happens to you because if you have the right view, if you have that peace that comes from knowing God, you will be victorious even in the most outrageous circumstances. And I believe God is preparing His church by saying, I want you to know me. I want you to really know who I am. I want you to know me in my heart, in your heart. And if you can do that, then you will be victorious in love. There's a circle, I, there's a, what I call the holy circle. You feel God as your lover. And what does that cause you to do? It causes you to obey His commandments. They used to seem hard. But now as you begin to feel Him as your lover, and know Him as your lover, obeying Him suddenly becomes easier. You don't even realize how it happened. And then as you begin to obey His commandments, what's His promise? If you, He who has my commands and obeys Him, He it is, I will love, and He who, is who loves me, I will reveal myself to them, John 14, 21. I will manifest myself to them. So all of a sudden, you're obeying the commandments. You're obeying, you're doing things right. And what happens is promises He'll reveal Himself more to you. So, if He reveals Himself more to you, then what? You feel Him more as your lover. So, as you feel Him more as your lover, then what? Obedience becomes easier, right? So, it's this wonderful circle. It's not a vicious circle, it's a holy circle. Mm -hmm. The more you obey, the more He reveals His love to you. The more He reveals His love to you, the more you, you are satisfied and at peace and in joy, and the more you find that you can walk in His ways. The more you walk in His ways, the more He reveals His love to you, the more He reveals you something. It just keeps going. And what happens is you grow up into full maturity. And you are victorious in whatever circumstances you find yourself in. So I'd like to, Liz, why don't you come on here? We're going to pray for you. I'm just going to speak a, a general blessing first. Because I believe that the Lord is, that the call has gone out us to know, because I believe there are dark days coming. I don't know when, I don't know whether it's next week, I don't know whether it's next month, but I believe there's dark days coming, and I believe that the Lord has called us to, to know Him and to be rock solid, mm -hmm. so that nothing can shake us, Thank nothing, can, we have peace and joy, right? I'm just going to pray a universal prayer for everybody first, and then Liz and I are going to be up here, and we will pray for anybody that wants individual prayer. Is that okay? Father, our hearts are to know you. Our hearts are to obey and to have you reveal yourself and then obey some more and reveal and obey. We just want that circle of love. Father, we ask that you take away any wrong view that we have that might have been built up by a wrong father image or a wrong uncle or a wrong baseball coach or anything that gave us a wrong view of you as a father. The church, the teachings of the church, the enemy, 
Lord, we just ask that you would erase those things, that you would implant into our hearts an understanding that you are good. Yes. That you are good, and that you love us, that you're a good father, and that you love us. Oh. And so we ask that you'd impart that to every single person in this room. Mm -hmm. oh, just open their hearts, see the yes in their spirit, and give them an impartation. An impartation oh. that you fundamentally love them. Yes, thank you. That, they, that, that you are for them. That everything you do is for their victory. And oh Lord, we just ask that they would begin to see themselves through that filter. That the, that the old filter, the old filter that their mother gave them, the old filter that their father gave them, the old filter that their teacher gave them, that they, they couldn't do it, or the negative filter that the enemies tried to put on them, we just rebuke that in the name of Jesus. And we say, let the filter come through clear that Jesus loves, that he's for, and that you are victorious. And you can be victorious. And I ask for the peace of God that passes all understanding to come down in this room and let, let the peace reign in every single heart. That no one would be anxious. That no one would be afraid. And let that trickle down or let that trickle down into behaviors. Things that used to seem hard. Things that used to be difficult. Things that used to, to not inspire. Let those things melt away. Let the love of God and the power of God permeate permeate completely mm -hmm. so that people walk in your ways. You. And let that be victorious in ministry, that every single person in this room's ministry would blossom, that they would be able to pour out love to others because you pour love into them, and that their ministry would not be filled with burnout or doubt or discouragement, mm -hmm. but that it would be victorious in every way. Mm -hmm. And no matter what circumstance you put, what, what circumstance you allow, in the world, that they would be victorious, that the victory would be theirs, that they would shine like stars you, in eternity. Lord. Let it be so, God, according to your word. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Well, thank you for allowing me to be here. Well, we're going to pray right now. If anybody wants to receive it.